That's your fifth draw four card. There's only four in a deck. Where did you get that? Found it. You gotta have a three in there somewhere. As a matter of fact, I do. <sighs> what, what is that? Where did you even get that? That card is not even a part of this game. I don't know, I just drew it from the pile. Okay, you, <clears throat> you know what, I can't, I can't, I can't do this. Uh, um, I'm sick. I, I can't come in today. I, had a, I don't want to spread any germs, so I can't. Nope. See ya. I just had a... But I have one card left. At first I thought it was going to be easy, have a camera that recognizes the color and number of a card and then just match the color or number, but I soon figured out it was going to be much, much more complicated. The whole process starts here with the draw pile. It's designed with these white tabs made out of HTT2 belting that are flexible enough yet rigid enough to knock cards off each other to singulate them. It's really important the robot only picks up one card at a time or it could ruin the whole downstream process. Then once the robot picks a card, it needs to be able to flip it so that the overhead camera can then determine what card it is. And that's what these are for. These are the card stations every robot has. It takes a card, flips it, slides down the ramp, and stores them here. And it has two pockets so the robot can sort through cards to pick whatever one it wants. Once the robot found the card it wants, it then has to pick it up and then play it in the discard pile right here. Now these barriers are simply for the human, so that they can't see what cards every robot has and then cheat. This configuration of modules may look a little random, but it's strategic in that every robot can reach what it needs to reach. Then the camera is able to see all the pockets where recognition is going to need to be happening. An important part of any robot system is end of arm tooling. Since the height of the card pile isn't always the same height, I went with a compliant suction cup gripper that was linked to a limit switch so the robot can tell when it reached the top of the card deck. There's a little bit of I.O. when it comes to controlling suction cup grippers with a valve, pump, motor, and everything. And I wanted it to be a simple, high or low output that controls the gripper on or off. So I built this cool gripper controller that takes a simple high and low input and does all the actual controls for the gripper internally. Inside, there's a little Arduino microcontroller for programming timings that controls a couple relays that controls the pump and the valve as well as a status LED to tell whether the pump's on or off, and it could either be bolted to a machine or snapped to DIN rail. I figured after I put this much time into over-engineering something, I wouldn't have any issues with it, but later on I had some issues with some bouncing on the input so the gripper would turn on and off repeatedly. A nice friend of mine offered to help diagnose the issue with an oscilloscope. While it was very interesting to see how the signals worked, we couldn't really figure out the cause of the issue exactly, we fixed some grounding issues, but in the end I just filtered out the bouncing input and never had an issue with it again.
one challenge I had was I had to work with older robots, which while they were more than capable of doing the job, they weren't able to do the level of processing it takes to run an entire game of Uno, as well as machine vision. So I offloaded this heavy lifting to a computer. Then the computer sends signals over Ethernet to an I.O. board using Modbus that talks to the I.O. of the robot controllers that tells them what move to make and when. So I picked up a couple of these IPIO relay output boards with eight relay outputs each. Now I also pulled this old analog and digital input card out of an old industrial machine that I'm using to sense if the light screen is blocked. And the computer needs to see if the light screen is blocked because that's how I can tell if the human took their turn or not. And it's also for safety reasons to stop motion if somebody crosses the light screen. Now learning Modbus isn't the most intuitive thing, so a huge thank you to a good friend who helped me figure this part out. You may have noticed on that communication diagram that I also included a speaker and a microphone. And the computer needs this because number one, it's funny, and number two, the computer and the human need to be able to communicate on what color they choose for their wild cards. I'll get into the speaking a little bit later, but the voice recognition was a fun thing to learn, and Microsoft Visual Studio made it pretty easy with their built-in tools. So now that the easy part is done, now it's time to do the challenging part, which is to get the computer to actually do everything. First thing the computer needs to do is to recognize cards, because if it can't recognize cards, everything else is useless. For this, I'm using Visual Studio's built-in ML.NET model builder, where you simply upload a folder that contains folders, and in each of those folders would be a type of card. For example, one folder would be filled with number one cards, another folder would be filled with number two cards, another folder would be filled with wild cards, and so for me, I had 16 different folders for 16 different types of cards, and I found it to be better if it finds the color later. So training the model is pretty easy. The challenging part is getting the correct data. It's important to collect the data in the same scene that it's going to need to recognize the object in. So what I had to do is take hundreds of photos of every card in every position, and then sort them all out into their different types of cards, and then train the model on this set. Now this is a lot of work to do by hand, but luckily I have a robot arm with the correct tooling sitting right there that can do it all for me. So I set up an infinite loop where the robot would pick a card, flip it over, put it in every spot it needs to take a picture of, it would move back, and then use my relay controlled mouse I used in a previous video to click a button to take a picture. And my program automatically crops every card position on the table, and that's how I collected all my data. And while it was easy to watch the robot do all the heavy lifting, the real challenge came when it came to sorting out every single card into their 16 different folders. Then it was a real bummer only to find out this didn't work good enough to use. You have to think over the course of a 25 minute UNO game, if you mess up one card recognition, the whole game is thrown off. So it's important that the card recognition be near perfect. I wasn't happy with this model set. In the end, I tried to use about 16 different data sets to try and get the right one. And in each of these data sets, I tried different techniques of processing the image. One data set was just black and white. One data set was just this part of the image. But what I ended up going with was the cropped lower right hand corner of the card for two reasons. One is that it doesn't have a lot of data to pick through to find pattern recognition. It just simply looks at the symbol and there's not a lot of noise and background to distract it. And I had issues with distincting the difference between six and nine. But the cool thing about the number in the corner is no matter which way you have your card, that symbol is facing the same way. Doing it this way, the model was a lot less confused in the difference between the number six and the number nine. But that wasn't good enough. There still wasn't enough images to train the model to be reliable enough. Looking at what other people did, they actually faked a lot of their data by using a good amount of real data and then made new data to give them millions of pictures to train the model on. So I did the same thing and adjusted the brightness 15 times in either direction and adjusted the rotation 20 times in either direction for every image of every card. And this led me with about 2.8 million pictures of UNO cards that took about 60 gigabytes worth of space. This model ended up taking around six hours to train, but it was reliable enough to depend on when using it to play in a game. And now that it was recognizing the card good enough, the next issue was to get it to recognize the color. All color is to a camera is a simple three number value, your values of red, green, and blue ranging from 0 to 255. Any mixture of those three colors can make any color you need to display on a screen. The twist is that the game of Uno has four colors, three of them being red, green, and blue, but the fourth one being yellow. 
unexpectedly, the color yellow is actually very hard to differentiate between green when it comes to reading the RGB values, especially in conditions where the lighting changes from one spot of the table to the next. I tried hard coding this by using a ratio of the values of green and yellow as compared to blue, but this was not reliable and constantly gave me issues, so I decided to utilize AI once again to solve an uncodable problem. I first took five different pictures of every color card at every one of the four stations on the table where cards are recognized. This is important because the lighting changes from station to station. I then put all this in this Excel document where I could easily visualize the difference of the red, green, and blue values of the region of interest. I then put them in these graphs to help visualize the difference in the colors. And you can see from reading left to right, there's four clusters of data, one cluster per area of the table. And you can see the values in unison raising and dropping due to the changes in lighting. But you can tell there's a consistent pattern between the red, green, and blue, and that there's more red than the rest, there's more blue than the rest, so on with blue, but yellow really is just a mixture of red and green. And it's pretty easy to see that difference with our eyes looking at this graph, but if you're comparing the green and yellow graphs, you can see where the computer gets confused between green and yellow. So what I did is I noted the area that the photo was taken in, the red, green, and blue values, and then also what color it was, and put it in a table that I fed another model in ML.net to predict color, and this solved my problem perfectly. The model was able to easily pick up on the pattern that humans can see, no matter the lighting, as long as I told it what area of the table the photo was taken in, and the corresponding red, green, and blue values. Imagine this scenario. Robot 1 places a wild card and chooses the color red. Now the human doesn't have any red, so he has to draw a card. But then all Robot 2 can see is a wild card. Robot 2 doesn't know if the human played another wild card, or they had to draw a card. This is incredibly important because it determines what Robot 2 should do, whether it should ask what color the human chose, or if it should keep the color red that Robot 1 chose. So it's incredibly important to sense whether or not the human draws or plays a card. The first way I tried going about doing this is sensing for motion. If the computer sees enough motion over the discard pile as compared to the draw pile after the person pulls their hand back, then that's how it would figure out if they drew or played a card. And that worked for the most part, but there was a big issue in that the table slightly shakes and that threw it off every once in a while. But there is a better way to do this. Instead, I'm using an image subtractor. Right before the human's turn, it takes a photo of the discard pile. Then after the human takes their turn, it takes another photo and subtracts these two images, and then if there's enough difference between the two, that's how we can tell if the human drew a card or played a card on top of the existing card. Even if it's the same exact card, they just need to be off a little bit in order to tell if a new card was placed. With the computer now being able to recognize cards, now we need to tell it what it can do with them. For the ease of programming, every card was given its own unique number, and they're listed in this list right here. The card number for a blue zero is zero, card number for a blue one is one, and so on for every card in the entire game. And each of those cards are listed in this list. And each card in this list has a list of cards they could be played against. So if the computer needs to figure out if a blue zero right here could be played up against a blue two, then it needs to be able to find it in this list. After meticulously filling every card in the entire game, the computer can now look up which card is playable against which cards. For the smarts of actually choosing what card to play, there's not much you can really do in the game of Uno, because it's all random. Someone actually tried to use reinforcement learning in AI to find the best way to play Uno, and after a hundred thousand simulations of using reinforcement learning, the algorithm was only 3% more likely to win against a random player. So not a big enough difference to use here. Instead, a better strategy in my scenario is just to pick the closest card to the top of the robot's pile. That way the game goes quicker, because it does take some time to swap cards between the two piles. And this really didn't have an effect on how often they won. Since the robot needs to speak anyway, I decided to make it fun by giving it a bunch of different responses it can do for every different scenario. Whenever it draws a card, it picks a random statement while it's drawing a card. Whenever it plays a special card, it has a list of different taunts it randomly picks through. Generally, short statements that make it funny every once in a while. And whenever one of the robots wins at the end, it has a short rant it goes on about. I actually had ChatGPT write up all of these 20 different responses that it could randomly pick from whenever one of the robots wins. And some of the statements that 
ChatGPT came up with were pretty scary about artificial intelligence taking over and being better than humans at everything. So read through these if you like, they're pretty funny. Sorry. I suppose Red will have to do. It's the least inferior option. Your turn. Along with the verbal abuse from the robots, there's also physical abuse. No, just gestures pretty much. But I thought it'd be funny if the robot would make fun of and gesture the other robots whenever they put down a special card that makes them draw cards or something. I programmed a bunch of these different taunts that the robot does to the other robot. And so whenever the robot makes a power move, it then reaches over and taunts the other robots, which makes it seem more alive and it's a lot funnier. Well, until one robot is too close to the other taunting it, then this, you haven't figured out your safety interlock for not allowing one robot to move while the other is in motion. And then while one robot's taunting the other, the other one starts his turn and then they punch each other. Then the scary part is it moves a table carrying 400 pounds worth of robots on it. So yeah, safety first. Since the robots are controlled by the computer, I need to make this interface that shows me all the debugging information, all the information about the current state of the game, and gives me options to run and manage the game. And that's what this program's doing. Not only is it running the UNO game, but it also gives me the options to interfere if, if a card is read wrong, gives me settings for starting a game, selecting what camera to use, and just generally shows me a lot of debugging information to make sure everything's working properly. And since everything's controlled by my computer, I couldn't resist making another interface that's designed for someone to play as a robot through my computer. Instead of the robot making all the decisions, all the information is forwarded to this interface and somebody who's on the computer can then play as the robot. All I have to do is give him remote access to my computer and anywhere in the world that has an internet connection can play UNO with me through an industrial robot arm. And while testing it, I had a bunch of my friends play with me while they were out of state. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Red 7, I can see you are not too good at this. My turn. Ha ha ha. Ah, the sophistication of yellow. A choice suitable for a person of my caliber. Take your turn. Seriously. A red six. My turn. I don't like this game anymore. Here we go. Red 8, that's the best you got. My turn. The best part is these robots are smack talking. The program that runs all this took a long time to make, just about 300 hours over the course of 7 months. With around a total of 6,000 lines of code, there was a ton of bugs to work out. And this took a lot of time in testing because there's so many different scenarios in the game, it really just takes sitting down and playing Uno for hours until something goes wrong and then try to fix it. But with all the gained experience and learning, the project was well worth it. I see a yellow too. My turn. I win, as the last card gracefully descended from my mechanical hand. It symbolized not only the conclusion of the Zuno game, but also the undeniable reality of your inferiority in the face of my intricate decision-making algorithms. 